Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all here. Again, welcome to those of you that are online. We started this series on the Pentateuch. So the Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible, the five books of Moses, also called the Law or the Torah. We started this series in the fall uh, with a sermon on the fear of God. And that's one of the goals that we have for this series is to increase our experience of the fear of God. And we saw that the fear of God really had three characteristics to it. One of them was awe. And awe means that you are are taking in, you are experiencing something so majestic and wonderful that it leaves you speechless and you're just drawn to its beauty and its power or its size. But there's also this element of of fear. Fear that um, in some way, somehow, this, this, this... experience is going to poss- could possibly harm you. And then the third element is this idea of overwhelming control. And so the, it kind of blends these two ideas. And so there is, a, there is something about what you're fearing that is captivating um, and that if you weren't experiencing it, you'd be missing out and there would be painful consequences for not drawing closer. And so there's, there's awe, there is fear, and, and there's this sense that, that you're controlled by it. So our goal, again, is to, is to grow in our fear of God. And the, the big idea is that the, the, the bigger that we see God, the smaller the problems in our life lives will seem. And so we have a, we have a tendency, especially with all of the, the influences from all the various streams of media that we uh, indulge in, we have a a tendency to just start focusing in on all of the bad things in the world and all of the bad things in our lives. And these things become like like a spoon right in front of our eye. It's all we can see. And so we want to expand our knowledge of God. We want to expand our our vision of God. We want to strengthen and deepen in our fear of God. And the Pentateuch, one of its purposes specifically, as we read in the book of Deuteronomy at the beginning of the series, is to do that, is to do that. And this, this growth in the fear of God then picks up on another theme that we introduced, because uh, the text introduced us to it, uh, this idea of walking wholeheartedly before God in, in, right, in pursuit of righteousness and justice. And this, this idea of being wholehearted is that um, you're honest. There's, there's sincerity. There's no sense of, of shame or guilt in your, in your conscience, in your, in your walk with God, but also in your, in your life with, with other people. And so there's just this this freedom of living in a way that the, the New Testament would call it being above reproach. There's, there's nothing that you sense within you that anyone can say uh, bad about you about. And so this, this is also a part of the, the purpose of the Pentateuch is to grow this wholeheartedness before God and with other people, lives of confidence and integrity and a clear conscience. We're not compromised. So today, you know, we, we've concluded Genesis, and today we are starting the book of Exodus. And so the beginning uh, paragraph in the introduction of all of these, of, of Jacob and his sons, uh, connects us to the, the latter part of the book of Genesis because there's also a similar numbering of the peoples there. And so these two books are connected. But we come out of Genesis with some questions, with some questions. Who will be this promised child and king? That's really the, the overarching theme of the Pentateuch, but also of the entire Bible. This promise made to man and woman in chapter 3, after they disobeyed God, after they were uh, pushed out of his presence, God had promised them that there would, be, there would come a child, the woman would give birth to a child who would destroy death, who would destroy uh, corruption that's in the world, who would destroy evil, who would ultimately destroy the serpent that introduced all of these things into the world. And so from that point on, the people in the book of Genesis are waiting. Who is going to be this, this child? And so we still have that question. We know now that it's going to come through the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and specifically the son Judah of Jacob. And so there's about 100 people. The, the 70 that are named are the men and the sons. It's not the wives and the daughters. Uh, it's over, probably over 100 people. It's not very big. And are they ever going, what's going to happen to them? 
And are they ever going to come into this land that God has promised them? We also know, because God told Abraham, your people, your family, your nation are, are going to be enslaved for a period of about 400 years, but that God would judge the nation and deliver them from that. And we also have the question, how is God going to use Israel? Because Israel emerges out of the nations. Israel emerges out of the nations, and the nations have all um, really abandoned God and pursued their own ways. And so we saw the climax of evil as a world uh, in, in the flood in Genesis chapter 6, and then these nations split apart, and they all go their separate ways. But from all of the nations, God raises up one nation so that they become the, the manifestation, the example of what it means to live wholeheartedly before God, following his ways in pursuit of righteousness and justice. And so how is God going to take this nation? Especially, you know, you get into those stories in Genesis, as we saw, and it doesn't seem like there's anything exceptional about the way these people live. They still have a lot of problems and conflicts, marital problems, children issues. Some are still worshiping foreign gods. And so you're asking, how is God going to form righteousness in these people as a nation um, when they seem to be just like everybody else? So those are, the, those are the questions that we leave Genesis with. And now we come into the book of Exodus. So, this, in, so the first paragraph, book of Exodus, this, this hundred people or so, grows over a period of 400 years um, to be a mighty nation, vastly larger than uh, where they were at at the beginning. And so, you know, uh, the Europeans first came to America about 400 years ago. So that's about the period of time, early 1600s. Obviously, they were, there were Native Americans here at the time, but so, we, you know, we're off roughly 320 or 330 million now. So over 400 years, you can grow a lot. And so what eventually happens is that a new king of Egypt emerges. And so the people of Egypt, for a while, were very grateful to the man Joseph, who was from the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were thankful to Joseph because Joseph saved them from extreme famine during the, 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 the early years there in, in Egypt. And so they forget about what Joseph had done. They forget about the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who were honored in that first generation. And Pharaoh, the king, becomes very fearful. He becomes fearful of his position as king. He becomes fearful for the nation. And so what he does is he creates this us versus them narrative based upon fear, based upon fear. If you read the passage there, he says, Behold, the people of Israel are too many, and they are too mighty for us. He says, Let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. So they, they might multiply more. Now, that's a pretty sure bet. But if war breaks out, that's the first if, and if they join our enemies, and then if they fight against us, and then if they escape. So he builds this us versus them narrative. He takes the, the probably at that time at least somewhat of a minority group, and he pits the majority Native Egyptians against them with a series of fears that haven't, there has, these things aren't true yet. And so what happens is that, like we see in a lot of our own mistakes or on the national scene or international scene, uh, the fear that Pharaoh has actually starts driving him to the ends that he was fearful of. Because as we, if you're familiar with the story, obviously, um, Egypt is thwarted and decimated and they leave. The Israelites leave. And so that's the story that we're in. And so he builds up this, this narrative, and then they subject the Israelites to harsh and it's humiliating slavery. And that doesn't work. The more they oppress Israel, the more they multiply. There's one, one Jewish commentator on this passage says that, 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 is, that the readers are to credit 
the noble wives and women of Israel for what they did is that they, they went into the fields and they went into the workplaces and they seduced their husbands because they weren't coming home. They're spending more hours working. And so the, the women all want to have kids. So they go to the workplace instead of waiting for them to come home and seduce them and they just continue to have more kids. Now, obviously, the text doesn't say that. There's just trying to explain how in the world that would happen. So anyway, so that doesn't work. And so Pharaoh resorts to infanticide. We have got to kill the male children when they are born. And so that's really where the story ends here in chapter 1. But I want to take just a few moments to, to address the question, what is Egypt? What is Egypt? Well, first of all, Egypt is a place of natural abundance because of the Nile River. So the Nile River would, fl- would flood uh, regular periods throughout the year. And this would bring um, all the water that they needed to grow their crops. And they would set up irrigation systems and ways to store the water. And they would bring a lot of silt in from the places where the floods would come from. And so it was very fertile soil. And they also worshipped Ra, the sun god. So they had water and they had the sun. And they recognized these things as some form of, of deity because it's what provided for them. It's what they saw provided for them. Now, Egypt also strived against decay and death. They were were aggressive to pursue health. They were aggressive in their pursuit of fertility and ageless beauty and longevity. We see this in the the embalming and the mummification and and in the the massive temples and pyramids that that were the... um, the burial mounds for the, the elite and especially the, the kings and the king's family, um, thinking that they would be, you know, they would come back to life again or they would go into a new life. But they, they've always, um, they, they shaved their heads so they, when they turned gray, you wouldn't really know. And so they were always trying to perpetuate this idea of being uh, vi- uh, viral and healthy and um, young. And they had a lot of gods to give honor to these things as well. Human beings had a low standing in the eyes of the Egyptians. They simply saw them as, as part of nature itself. There was, no, there was no deity that set humanity above anything else in nature. And even though they worshipped nature, they still tried to master it. And we see that they master it... Th- through sorcery and magic. We'll see that as the contest between God and Pharaoh and his magicians comes to pass, but also through technology. In terms of government, Egypt was an autocracy. Pharaoh was king, Pharaoh was God, um, and the entire country of Egypt was indentured to Pharaoh, which was a contribution that Joseph brought. Remember, they, they sold... Um, all their lands, all their animals, and then themselves to Pharaoh in order to survive the famine. So for centuries now, the entire natural citizenship of Egypt is under uh, Pharaoh as God and king, and they are indentured and enslaved to him. And it's a country that is not run by the rule of law, but by administration and bureaucracy. So that's, that's Egypt in a nutshell, and we'll continue to see other characteristics, characteristics of Egypt as we go through the plagues. Now, obviously, Egypt is, is not, we, we are not ancient Egypt, but you can see a lot of similarities. We are becoming a people that no longer recognizes that there is a personal God who has made human beings in his image, which gives them a special status and identity. God Uh, cares for us. God loves us. God has fashioned each and every one of us as a unique creation. And so human beings in, in in the scriptures have a special place in the eyes of God and a special place among creation. We are not just like the rest of the animals. We see in our own culture the weakening of this status to where, yeah, we're just like an animal. We may be a higher form of animal, but essentially we are just animals. We see, obviously, in our culture the the exaltation of of health and beauty and youth, and these things seem to be the pursuits of of almost everyone, especially people that we see as as celebrities and who are 
who our culture is drawn to, and we see an increased dependence upon a strong centralized government and bureaucracy to really take care of all of our needs. Remember, if you, if you recall the story, um, the people of Egypt were willing to enslave themselves to Pharaoh as long as he continued to feed them and take care of them. We see greater and greater power in the hands of fewer and fewer rich and powerful people that govern this nation. So we see that, that power, the pursuit of power, and you especially obviously see this in the, in the, the, the uh, really the broken and deadlocked uh, government and the two-party system, where the pursuit of power, the obtaining of power is the goal, not righteousness, not justice, not the rule of law, the pursuit of power and the use of power is becoming the de facto reality. I mean, we have laws and we have a system of justice, but you can see that really what the pursuit is, 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 is controlling the arms of government so that you can pursue your path and pursue your ways and pursue your goals. And so this is, the, this, is, this is where Israel is at. This is the nation that they are embedded in. And God has made promises to this nation. We as readers are aware of these promises, okay, because we've just completed the book of Genesis, and it doesn't take us centuries to get through the book of Genesis. But it's not real clear on what the actual people in these circumstances know and understand. We don't have any examples like in, in Genesis chapter 6 where we see Noah's father Lamech say, I'm going to name my son Noah because may, maybe he's the child that we've been waiting for that will save us from our toil. So in the midst of all this toil that they're experiencing, which, which lasted at least 100 years. Right, you kind of get the sense that this went on for maybe a few months or even a few years, but, but really this period of enslavement lasted for around 100 years or more. And we don't hear, or at least it's not recorded, any statement from the people yet where they are crying out to God to fulfill his promise. God, give us our land. Make us a sovereign people. Bring us this child who can deliver us from this toil. We'll see in chapter 2, some movements start to take place. But to this point, God has done nothing to alleviate the suffering. Now remember, Moses, you know, he's going to raise Moses up. But Moses becomes a man, becomes an adult, flees, and doesn't come back to Egypt until he's 80. So this has been going on. I mean, kids are being born. Uh, generations are happening. So it's a long time. But God is not inactive. We're going to see that he, he knows what's going on, and he remembers. He remembers his promises. We're going to see that in chapter 2. But he is taking, and he's taking some subtle actions. So we could ask, well, what, what is God's delay? And oftentimes, we ask ourselves the same question. What is taking so long for God to do something that he said he was going to do? The Psalms are filled with promises that God is not slow to carry out justice in the face of injustice when we call to him for help. We see these kinds of promises throughout Scripture, but yet oftentimes we ask, why is there a delay? And we have to then ask the question, is there a purpose for Israel going through many generations of slavery? Is there a purpose for them? Is there a purpose for the reader? What does it mean to be a people that come out of slavery? And this is obviously, if you've been through the redemption group process, this is one of the big themes. What does it mean to be a people? What does it mean to be a person to come out of slavery? Well, you know, if you've never experienced slavery, the experience of freedom is, is less of an experience. You can enjoy freedom, but if you've never been enslaved, the experience of freedom will not be as glorious as if you were enslaved and are now free because you can look back and remember those years of suffering 
and to know now that you are no longer experiencing that suffering. See, what, what God does often is prolong the suffering that we're in for a greater experience of glory and gratitude and worship later on. An experience that we would not have had, an experience this nation would not have had, had he delivered them right away. And again, it it seems almost like this is at least as much for the reader as it is for the nation themselves. But again, God is not completely absent from this scene at this point. He does something. It's subtle, but he does something. What he does is is that he blesses the midwives for disobeying Pharaoh. And it says that the midwives did this because they feared God. Because they feared God. Here's the text, verse 15. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua. Notice that the Pharaoh is never named. The king of Egypt is never named. But these two midwives are. They have a name that will continue out in eternity in the word of God. When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. And when we typically think of fear, we typically think of pulling back, of being afraid, of running away, of, of, of cowering down. But having a fear of God is something fundamentally different. And so you see here that that the fear of God for them strengthened them. It energized them to stand in the face of Pharaoh, the king of the most powerful nation on the planet at that time. So these two lowly midwives are standing in front of Pharaoh, face to face with him in disobedience. See, the fear of God strengthens people. It strengthens us to move away from evil, to move away from wrong, to move away from unrighteousness, and it presses us to do the right thing, even in the, even in the potential threat of great harm that may come to us. That's what the fear of God does. And when we started off the, 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 the book of Genesis, we didn't have a lot of material to work with to see some examples of, of of what this idea of the fear of God is, but now we do. So we first ran across this this notion of the fear of God in in, in Genesis uh, chapter 20 or 21 when Abraham and Sarah had just been promised that they would have a son from Abraham's body, from Sarah's body within a year. And they go to Gerar, which is what later becomes the country of the Philistines, And Abraham says this, he says, you know, I don't think that there is a fear of God in this place. And then he convinces Sarah to say that, hey, you're my sister, not my wife, so I won't be killed. And then we see it when Abraham is commanded by God to sacrifice Isaac to him. God is testing him. And God tells him, no, do not, you know, Abraham's about to kill his son. And God says, no, 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 stop, do not harm the boy. Now that I know that you fear God. And then Joseph, when he first encounters his brothers when they've come to sell grain in Egypt, he accuses them of being spies, which he knows they're not, but he he captures and imprisons all 11 of them, or 10 of them at the time, and um, he keeps them in prison for three days. But then he he lets him out and he says, you know, I'm only going to, because I fear God, I'm going to hold one and I want you to take, I want you to go back to your family and I want you to take enough grain to feed them. Because I fear God. And so we see here characteristics of what it means to fear God. The first thing is there is an acknowledgement that God 
exists. That God exists. He is real. He is seeing. And that he has established, this this is the second thing. God has established a moral order that establishes righteousness for everyone. We see here just in these examples, there is prohibition against adultery. When they first went to Egypt, even the king of Egypt at that time, and I think this is Genesis chapter maybe 13 or 14, upon discovering that Sarai is Abram's wife, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, this is hundreds of years earlier, chastises Abram for lying to him. This is your wife. So there's a recognition that husband and wife mean something, even by people that wouldn't be following the biblical God, but they recognize that there is a God and that he has established a moral order. Murder. Murder is prohibited. Withholding aid from those in need. We see that in in the example of Joseph. And obviously direct disobedience to God. So we see some things here just in these three or four examples where fear of God prohibits people from engaging in unrighteous activity and presses them into righteous activity. That's the second thing. The third thing is that after recognizing that God exists and that he has established a moral order for righteousness, God will hold all human beings to account for how they live according to this standard. God will execute justice. He will take action to restore what was lost, and he will take action to deter future unrighteousness. So God exists, he's established a moral order, God will hold all people to account, and he will execute justice. To recognize those things is to possess a fear of God. And your greater the sense of these things, the greater sense that you have of God's existence, the more you understand the moral and righteous order that he has set, the more you believe and and hold on to in your mind that he is going to hold all human beings to account, that he will execute justice. The more you hold these things in your mind, the more you are going to experience the fear of God. And this draws us to him. This draws us to him. If we don't sear our consciences, which is a possibility, the scriptures talk about a, a, a potential that we have as human beings to walk in unrighteousness for so long that we get to the point to where we have shut out God, we have shut out his moral order, and we, we no longer sense shame and guilt from our own sin. That's what it means to sear your conscience, to sear your conscience. You don't believe in a right and a wrong, and you don't believe you commit any right and wrong, and you don't feel the the results of having committed right and wrong. So if we don't sear our consciences, we eventually see our unrighteousness. We eventually see it. We go back to Psalm 90, how we kind of started the year off. God is our refuge and dwelling place for eternity. In contrast, we live very short lives. And we live short lives because in God's wrath, he ends our life because of our sin. And so we're left with two choices. What do we then do? Well, the example out of Psalm 90 is that we turn to God and say, okay, God, we recognize that you are our dwelling place and our judge. We ask for your mercy and we ask for your wisdom to live. So we can either keep running away from God, searing our consciences more and more, or we can run to him for mercy and for refuge. See, he's not just the lawgiver and the judge. He is a lawgiver and a judge, but he is also our friend and he's also our redeemer. And we see those ideas present within the Pentateuch. He called called Abraham his friend. So God is the lawgiver and judge, so he's 
he's the Congress, <laughs> he's the courts, and he's the police, all at the same time. That's what God does. But he's also the one who says, I will redeem you. I will redeem you. I was talking this week to a, a person close to me who doesn't believe that he can ever be forgiven. The idea of forgiveness is that, is that the, the sin is there in front of us. It's always before us. It's always before us. David said in Psalm 51, after committing adultery with Bathsheba, my sin, my iniquity is always before me. Well, God offers forgiveness, and forgiveness literally means that it's picked up, the iniquity is picked up, the sin is picked up, and it is removed. It's taken away. That physical image is important. It's right there. It's right before our eyes. We can see it. God can see it. He picks it up, and he moves it. It's out of the way. And we're going to see, you know, it, it's, it's common for us to believe, and this, this is kind of the narrative. God is so righteous and holy that he couldn't stand us in his presence, and that's why he made the sacrifices, and that's why he ultimately gave us Christ. That's not really a very accurate narrative. What we're going to see as Exodus unfolds is that God keeps actively pursuing us, aggressively pursuing us, wanting to dwell with us. What we see in the book of Exodus, it's not that God is pushing us away because we're so unrighteous. It's that we keep backing off from God's pursuit because our consciences can't stand to be in his presence. That's what we're going to see when, we, when, when the people of Israel come to Mount Sinai and Mount Sinai is there. They tell, they're going to tell Moses, Moses, we can't stand to be in God's presence lest we die. You talk to him and then you talk to us because we don't want to be in the presence of God. And they backed off. That's the problem. The problem isn't that God doesn't want to be with us. The problem is that God wants to be with us, but we don't really want to be that close to him because of our, <clears throat> our consciences aren't able to handle it. So we're going to see elaborate ways unfold in the books of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, elaborate ways that God works to help us get clear consciences. But as the book of Hebrews highlights, none of these things that we see that will emerge in the ceremonies and rituals and laws and sacrifices, none of them do the job completely because they have to be done every day or every month or every year. But what we have in, in, in God through Jesus Christ is the final act of God's redeeming effort and reconciling effort toward us, the final sacrifice that brings forgiveness And so God does need to execute justice. And we're either going to take it or we're going to believe that Christ took it. And we have to ask ourselves when we're, when we're struggling with our own sin and, we, and it's so massive before us, we have to ask ourselves the question, is the blood of Jesus Christ enough or not enough to cover my sin and iniquity? It's the blood of God. It's the blood of the Son of God. And this is where faith kicks in. This is where faith kicks in. Yes, the blood of Jesus. Yes, the, the justice that Jesus took for me is enough. The justice that Jesus took for me is enough. See, and, and what happens in that is that there is a restoration there is a restoration. God, God works through the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit, upon faith in that message, the Holy Spirit comes into us and regenerates us and begins to cleanse us, begins to restore us in moving us towards Christ's righteousness, moves us towards Christ's likeness. He does a restoring work in us to bring us to the place where we are like him. 
And with, with the blood of Christ continuing to cleanse us, we can always be in this place of wholeheartedness before God with a clear conscience, walking before him in honesty and sincerity. It doesn't mean we stop sinning. It means that there is a constant recognition of Christ's death for our sin, which is constantly cleansing. And so I'm not overwhelmingly burdened by the, by the guilt of my sin anymore. The punishment happened. And there's also this work of deterrent in that the more we recognize God's love for us, God's pursuit of us, God's sacrifice of his son for us, God's longing for us to walk wholeheartedly before him in righteousness, the, the gift of a clear conscience, the more we experience this kind of, of, of love from God, which is really coming out of this, this growth of the fear of God, the more we're drawn towards him. And it's this, it's this process and this cycle that grows and grows and grows and builds on itself. And so that, that our recognition of God's love, our fear of God, our wholeheartedness before him, our Christ-likeness, they, they're all, all of these things are working together. But we do have to come to this place. We do have to come to this place where we recognize that, yes, the... Blood of Jesus Christ is enough. The justice of God on Christ was enough for the justice that I deserve. Let me pray. Lord God, we thank you for these texts. We thank you for the, the courage and strength of those Hebrew midwives who feared you. And in that fear of you, were able to live with great courage against the, the mightiest ruler on the planet. And so, God, we long for that type of experience, to know you, to fear you in a way that, that, that presses us against the unrighteous deeds that we can so easily engage, uh, engage in and presses us, God, to do, to do right, to do good, um, to serve and, and to know you for fear of you. God, we're thankful for the fear of you because it, it, it is an empowering and energizing experience. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen.